You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Both Sides of the Prescription brings together Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron to discuss pertinent medical issues from both an alternative and traditional medicine perspective. So now, please welcome the hosts of Both Sides of the Prescription, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Welcome, everyone, to Both Sides of the Prescription radio show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Dr. Megan Kirschling, and like every Wednesday night, I am joined by my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling, as we tackle some of the best conversations in health and wellness from both sides of medicine. Uh, Tonight, we're going to actually talk a little bit about how your gut microbiome, which we've talked a lot about in the past, can affect both the brain um, and then also stress hormones, and we're also going to dive into another article that came out in the New York Times about uh, the need to eat a good breakfast. And so we'll sort of talk about the science, research, and information about those two articles. But before we get into the conversation, let us tell you a little bit more about us as your hosts and what brought us together um, besides the family ties for this radio show. I am Dr. Megan Kirschling, and I work outside of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area at a holistic clinic. Uh, And my uh, career in the health uh, services has spanned from a floor nurse on an organ transplant floor to a holistic functional medicine doctor. And I work both in women's health and family practice and really try to tie together both sides of medicine and the information and research that goes across the gamut from pharmaceuticals and medications to different supplements and even certain energy modalities. And what I've learned from the time that I've had the privilege of working with patients is that a lot of times people are sort of torn between which side of medicine they want to be on. Do they want to go more the alternative path or do they want to stay more of a traditional path? And Unfortunately, I think that we don't give them that true um, capability and ability to talk about both sides of medicine so that they can really sometimes meet in the middle because I think sometimes this isn't a black and white topic. There's a lot of gray areas and those are the gray areas that we sort of want to talk about, discuss, um, and bring to light for all of our listeners. And so every week we get together and I have a conversation with my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. Well, good evening, Megan. It's uh, good to be back after a couple weeks. I uh, will say a little bit about myself. I am a traditionally trained um, medical physician. I've been in clinical practice now for over 30 years. I was originally uh, trained in internal medicine, and then I subspecialized in medical oncology and hematology. And uh, my day-to-day activities are really uh, almost all exclusively clinical, taking care of uh, patients with a large population of, uh, of uh, cancer-related uh, uh, conditions. And for many years, um, in dealing with patients with life-threatening illnesses, it, I've become very aware of the fact that not only are they interested in the kind of what I guess you could say traditional therapies are that I might be able to offer them as a medical oncologist, but the whole experience, the whole cancer experience makes them want to really re-examine all aspects of their life. And in that context, they're, they're also very interested in their own wellness. And so almost every day I will get some sort of a question uh, f- from a patient regarding what would be the best diet for them now? Uh, what would be uh, supplements that they could use that could assist them in them getting well? 
uh, what else can they do with their with their daily living that will help them in in a complementary fashion? Uh, oftentimes, I've am brought forward questions regarding alternative therapies as well, and and so this is an area that I've in some senses had to deal with for a long time. I've been very fortunate to have uh, uh, Megan uh, with me uh, with regard to us both being in healthcare. As you can probably tell, uh, Megan's journey has been uh, very interesting, going from nursing to to chiropractic, to nutritional chiropractic, to nurse practitionership, first in women's health and then family medicine. And certainly uh, I've been exposed uh, due to her a variety of interest to aspects of medicine that I probably would not have delved into as deeply, such as functional medicine. So this has uh, been very enjoyable for me and I think helpful to my patients. As Megan said, I think that we both feel that we should offer our patients uh, the whole variety of available assets to them and them getting better, whether it's from an illness or them reaching their best sense of wellness. And so our feeling is is that um, rather than people having to make an either or decision, we want to allow them to have as many options available to them allow them to be educated and then make the decisions that they feel are best for them. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing is that uh, when we really talk about these two topics tonight, I think it's going to be interesting because we've talked about both of these topics, um, which will get into sort of fasting and the right way of eating and the gut microbiome a lot on our shows. I think it's one of the conversations that probably one of the two that tends to come up either in conversation or we've talked about specifically, but I think these are two great examples of lifestyle changes, um, things like that, that really affect both sides of medicine. Yes, I, I, I think that's, I, I, I really believe that that is uh, absolutely correct. I, um, I think I've mentioned this on previous broadcasts, but, uh, you know, this whole issue of the microbiome is something that I think is rapidly evolving and, um, and is entering into mainstream medicine and I think uh, will uh, we'll do so more and more. Um, I remember not, not that many years ago, uh, I, w- I had some interest in a, a national a wellness clinic that was primarily looking at uh, diet, exercise, weight loss modifications. And uh, in attending a conference, uh, a comment was made about whether or not there was any uh, need to be aware of your microbiome or concern about it in in kind of dealing with reaching peak wellness. And the speaker categorically said that he did not think that it would ever be important. And and in fact, I... um, I think that that was probably 180 degrees off from what the real truth is. And I think that um, there's just more and more data that is indicating that uh, we have to respect all components that uh, that make up our body. And and it's undeniable that the microbiome is 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 a very important component of our um, ability to maintain health. Well, and I think to start and talk about the microbiome and some of the facts that we've brought up in other shows, so for people who are listening or tuning in maybe for the first time or haven't listened to some of the microbiome shows that we've done, is that even the fact that we are made up of about 10 trillion cells, but that the bacteria um, that make us up and, you know, the bacteria uh, in our body is about 100 trillion. So we're outnumbered 10 to 1 when it comes to our cells versus bacteria. And you know, I think that it's gotten a lot of good, you know, research and publicity for the gut, um, which we'll talk a little bit about. But when we talk about the microbiome, we now know that it affects, you know, enzymes, it affects um, absorption, it affects digestion, uh, it plays a big role, you know, in our sinuses and in our lungs and in our skin. And so there's really just a huge array of functions that we depend on every day because of this microbiome. And so it is really important for us not to only respect it, but to realize how important it is when it comes to health and wellness. And I I think the study that you were interested in and wanted to talk about tonight uh, actually expands that thought um, to what appears to be some really quite 
direct connections between our gut and uh, brain health and our ability to cope with stress. Well, and I do also like that this shows the complexity of it. So I think this is a great segue into how all of those things um, are sort of tied together. So if you want to sort of start and talk about the study, then I'll just interrupt you whenever I want to. <laughs> well, the the study that uh, caught your interest was from uh, Science Daily. It, the title of it was gut microbes may talk to the brain through cortisol. And this was a, uh, a study that they point out is unlikely ever to be necessarily able to be done on humans, but which um, I think brought some pretty remarkable data. Uh, and in it, what they, the in these animal studies they were doing, they were studying one month old piglets, which um, as much as we may or may not like this, are probably one of the uh, closest species to human beings in terms of their gut and their brain development. And in the study, uh, what they were doing is that they were looking at uh, the bacteria in the feces of the piglets, and then from that, they were trying to see if the different, the different combinations of bacteria or the different amounts of, of bacteria could be correlated with any biomarkers in the blood or the brain um, that could be associated with uh, a potentially uh, increased incidence of various uh, central nervous system disorders. Well, and some of the information in here, I was actually just um, surprised by. And I think one of the things that you were saying too is that when we look at piglets and some of the things that we can do um, to sort of try to tie together some connections, is that we're actually finding that the microbiome and the probiotics that they're um, subjected to, especially in infancy. So, you know, they're sort of taking, I think, the piglets because there's, you know, a clean slate. But what we're finding is that there's a huge effect on brain development and, you know, what they call neurometabolites. And so when we think about all those little chemicals that talk to our brain, that we're seeing by what kind of bacteria these piglets had, that it was having a direct effect on brain development and the communication to the brain, which I think is really fascinating. Yeah, and I think what they were able to actually um, begin to suggest is that uh, different microbiomes in these mm -hmm. um, in these piglets uh, resulted in you know different concentrations of of neurometabolites, which could potentially in the future, as you say, uh, be correlated with um, the development or lack of development of of uh, area, various parts of the brain. And. Uh, I think it's so interesting because of the thing, too, that when we look at a lot of this and we look at the fact that, you know, there is this connection, I think this also dives deeper into another really important conversation in health and wellness and one that I think we're really uncovering more and more, which is the brain and gut connection. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is if we look at how medicine and some of the research and studies that we've done, we can see how this all evolves. And I think the microbiome is really interesting to see how our fascination in medicine has evolved into the microbiome. You know, the 1990s were the year of the brain and we wanted to really, you know, get after all of this, you know, information about the brain and how the brain works and this mysterious organ. And then during that time too was the year or was the year was the sort of time where we were trying to uncover that human genome and trying to say, okay, if we can uncover people's genes and if we can uncover people's brain makeups and what makes people's brains work, then we'll really get to the core of health and wellness. Well, we got done with both of those, the decade of the brain and, you know, the human genome project. And we immediately went into the fact that it's actually more important if we look at the second brain, the gut, and if we look at the microbiome. And we then went into the human microbiome project, which we're still trying to uncover. So I think we should talk a little bit more about the brain and gut after these commercials. Uh, everyone stick with us. You're listening to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global and TuneIn Radio. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support 
to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion. And then together, we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the Prescription Radio Show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. So Megan, we were um, we were speculating from from this study that we were examining uh, what it may tell us about the connection between the gut and the brain, and um, the reason that uh, they did this study was that um, in infants was, as you said, I think that um, they're beginning to feel that this issue of the microbiome is not you know isn't an issue that deals just with adult illness, that it's something that be, can be actually crucial for brain development. And um, their capacity to do this in the piglet is something that um, is likely never to be able to be done in human infants, particularly if, if you talk about um, you know working with biomarkers that come from the brain. But I think even though it's animal in animal study information, uh, I think it is supporting evidence for what we were talking about. That uh, there, it's just undeniable that there are issues with regard to the gut that can directly um, affect brain function, and and likely could be the the cause of a, a variety of fairly significant uh, brain illnesses. And the other takeaway that I think is important is that it is really important to support this microbiome from an early age. And so, you know, some takeaways for people would be the importance of, um, as a mother, supporting your microbiome because we're passing on, you know, our bacteria from person to person, you know, and it's even as a father, it's really important because you're actually passing it on with the people that you hang out with. So um, that's where the microbiome is really important. But as a mother and a breastfeeding mother, you're obviously um, passing on your microbiome. Um, The baby gets a lot of um, the microbiome going through the vaginal canal. Uh, And so, you know, looking at all of those things and really, you know, trying to set up at the very beginning, the best not only count of microbiomes, you know, we talked about 100 trillion of these bacteria that live with us, but it's also, which they talk about in this uh, article, the fact that we need a variety. It's really the balance of that microbiome. So it's not just the number of strains, which people talk about a lot, but it's also making sure that you have the different kinds of strains um, and that they're balanced throughout your body. So if you were going to take that information and um, and present it practically to a, a mother who came in into your office, uh, what kind of what kind of practical recommendations would you make to her? I think that it's important to look at um, a few things. Now, most children um, and most infants, uh, there's two main strains of back, uh, probiotics that we talk about the most. Um, or families, if you will, um, lactobacillus and um, bifidobacterium. 
So now that most people, you know, have on their um, uh, radar uh, probiotics, most people have heard these two words before. But lactobacillus and bifidobacterium tend to be the two most important. It does seem because um, truly a child gets exposed or an infant or newborn gets exposed to a lot of lactobacillus in the vaginal canal that they tend to be more lactobacillus. Um, now, the thing is, though, is that they will – it's not like they have to come into this world with a full – um, posse of bacteria, uh, but to really make sure that they're supported in the lactobacillus category. And that obviously will be making sure that the mom's microbiome is good. Um, like I said, you know, if, uh, um, antibiotics are needed, um, like if, you know, the, they're, um, GBS positive or something like that, and they needed to get antibiotics for the safety, then to maybe even go a little bit higher doses on the mother if she's breastfeeding. Um, if it's formula fed or uh, the baby is not latching on, so they do have to go to more formula than breast milk, um, it would be maybe adding just a little bit of, you know, the one that people will go to is just a tiny bit of lactobacillus acidophilus um, or, you know, uh, trying to find a child-friendly um, probiotic so that you can sort of repopulate and get their bacteria where it needs to be. Mm, well, that makes sense. Um and I think there's very – isn't there very interesting information to to indicate the difference in the, the infant microbiome d- depending on whether they're vaginally delivered or by C-section? Yep. So there's a couple reasons that a child will go through the vaginal canal or benefits. Uh, one of them is the fact that they, that is a major um, way that they are exposed to the microbiome and then they can take that on because – a lot of people don't realize one of the places we need microbiome and can grow it the most is the skin. And I can't even tell you clinically how many people I see that come in um, and children that come in with really bad acne. Um, and it's just that we have to get their microbiome um, back. And I will tell you from doing a lot of stool samples with children, one of the things that I see is that it's not that their gut's out of balance um, in the sense of, you know, they have all these bacterias or fungal or um, viral infections that they shouldn't have or parasites. They just don't have enough probiotic and especially the lactobacillus. So, you know, I've worked with young children, you know, that are eight, nine or 10 with really bad acne that we find that they don't have enough good bacteria. We just put them on a couple different strains, you know, give them good amounts, especially the lactobacillus and everything really clears up. And what we usually get as feedback, which ties back to this article, is that all of a sudden they're doing better in school. They're able to concentrate better. They're not so irritable um, and things like that, which, you know, parents will think is their child children's norm. But really, it has a lot to do with the fact that their gut and microbiome biome is off. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that um Many times we've just simply um, haven't believed that there could be these interconnections and consequently we've uh, maybe not observed as uh, closely as we can uh, some of the things that happen when you, for example, maybe work on the microbiome mm-hmm. um, rather than them being actually in- incidental, there there very likely could be intentional consequences of improving the microbiome. Well, and I think it's another um, sort of uh, um, connection or positive thing about the conversations we're having because I think it's actually also a concern or um, occurrence because the fact is is that uh, a lot of times the doctor's prescribing antibiotics, um, and I, I see this less now, which is good, but they're not thinking about the fact that it would have an effect on the microbiome or that they would need to supplement because usually the people that are trained in uh, pharmaceuticals aren't trained in supplements. And so it's not that antibiotics are bad. It's just that we have to look at the whole picture and then be able to really um, support somebody from, you know, um, that sort of holistic approach. Well, I think there. I think there are both sides of the argument. I think that um, that one of the the things that I, I think is slowly coming to traditional medicine um, is the is the idea that uh, we we have to be very we have to begin to be a, a, a bit more intentional in using antibiotics. That um, that using them. Uh, too frequently um, can cause harm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And um, so I do, I do think there is, uh, there is that side of it. But as you said, um, antibiotic, and, and I would say that one of the greatest developments that we had in the, uh, in the 20th century were anti- antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they're, they're, they're life saving in, uh, in some situations. Uh, the hope is that uh, we can use them more consciously. And so we don't end up with overexposure to antibiotics and the development of resistant strains or what we've been talking about here, the havoc that can cause um, in the microbiome. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I think that that is really the important take home is that, you know, when it comes down to it, the reason why we have these conversations is because I feel like education and awareness um, is the best, you know, um, sort of way you can arm yourself uh, in this day and age. And the one other thing that, if I may um, bring up about the article that I wanted to share with our listeners, is that when you really look at the power of the gut brain connection and with the microbiome, that it really has an effect on some of these powerful neurotransmitters and brain chemicals. And the two that it talks about in this article um, are serotonin and cortisol. And the reason why I think it's important to really discuss this is that serotonin, and we can you know, sort of define this for our listeners, but serotonin and cortisol are two very powerful um, neurotransmitters and hormones in our body. And so by them affecting serotonin and cortisol, we really get a huge domino effect on our body. So this isn't something in isolation. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, um, that's exactly right. The, the thing that, uh, that, uh, fascinates me is that, um, not only is that important, but in actuality, we, we have to respect that, these interconnections are not one way, and right. um, and um, and a lot of times the mediation that's possible with these kind of um, c- these compounds such as serotonin and cortisol uh, can 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 have effects either way because of the um, amount of neural content content that there is in the gut itself. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that one of the most fascinating things is that. If we look at serotonin, which is that feel-good hormone um, that, you know, we talk a lot about and obviously people see doctors every year, you know, with the use of antidepressants, Um, antidepressants like SSRIs and, and SSNRIs, you know, they're really focused on trying to get your serotonin levels up. And that I think one of the most interesting things is that what we're really starting to find is that one of the reasons why people's serotonin might be so low or altered, it does come back to this microbiome um, or the gut, which I think is extremely powerful. So Megan, um, I know we have talked about this before when we had some had some discussions about supplements, that you feel that there are some supplements that we might even say are essential or ones that uh, any anyone might want to consider uh, uh, in sub and in, 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 for their health, and I guess I, I, w- I would ask you: Would you put probiotics in that category? Definitely, I think probiotics, when it comes down to it, um, have a huge role when it comes to necessity um, because we all. Our microbiome is under attack every day, you know, with especially this antimicrobial world we live in with antimicrobial hand washes, um, you know, uh, antimicrobial uh, situations, um, you know, antibiotics, all of those things, antibiotics in our meat and our food, those kind of things all have taken a uh, toll on our microbiome. And so... I think it's really important to make sure you're replenishing. And my rule with um, probiotics is that you should take one every day, but also change it up. So, you know, I've also had people who've come in who said, I'm good with a probiotic. I've been on the same one for 10 years. It's not just about the number. It's also about the different strains. So you want to make sure then that you're taking a large amount of uh, bacteria um, and the good bacteria in, but you also want to make sure that you're taking a lot of different strains and then to feed it with a prebiotic like fiber, inulin or FOS, which will help feed the bacteria. So, all right. Well, we are going to take a little break here for commercials. Stick with us as we start to get into the conversation of should we be eating breakfast? You're listening to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global and TuneIn Radio. America is out of control. 
Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. So, Megan, uh, I think this is a topic that both of us are learning more about. Uh, I find it fascinating. I think that it uh, it has some interesting links to how we may have evolved as humans uh, for our success to sustain ourselves. It it has a lot to do, I think, with our metabolism. And uh, I think it's a it's a field that's really opening up, and there's more and more being st- stated about it. And that is, is uh, it's not just the issue of of what type of calories we're taking in, but uh, how we take them in. Meaning, um, what time of the day do we take them in? Uh, do we take them in over an extended period of time, or do we take them in over a shorter period of time? And I know there was an article from the New York Times that uh, that you saw recently that. Uh, kind of brought this to light and we thought might it might be good to discuss. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the article that you discovered? So the article that I um, picked out for us to talk about is from August 21st, 2017, so fresh off the press, um, and it's called The Case for a Breakfast Feast. And I really wanted to sort of dive into this one because I think it has a lot of great um, tangent conversations that you and I can sort of get into. But Um, In a nutshell, what this is saying is that when we look at it, most of us will, you know, um, sort of eat lightly in the morning. They'll maybe grab a coffee or, you know, um, just a sort of, you know, on the run kind of quick morning breakfast, um, which usually isn't even a breakfast. It's more of like a snack. Um, And then most of us will eat, you know, maybe like a average size to medium size lunch. And then most of us have the largest meal. Um, in the evening and eat a large amount at night. And what it does is it looks at, especially um, uh, it took into account in this article, the Seventh Day Adventists, um, and they looked over 50,000 of them, so a large population, over 70 years. And some of that research and evidence suggests that we really should be front-loading our calories, that we should be eating more during the day. We should break our fast at night, Um, and eat a large meal in the morning and then followed by a medium lunch or dinner or sorry, big breakfast, medium uh, lunch and a small to almost no dinner. And that there actually is some um, benefits in different chemicals and signals. And really when they look at like the blood, uh, they saw a reduction in different risk factors for heart disease, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, and just inflammatory markers. And so that maybe what we need to really do is sort of change the way most of us are eating. So, Megan, this was um, this was interesting. And I think that 
logically, it it makes a lot of sense um, in the aspect of uh, your your I think balancing a little bit more your intake of calories to your workload, but there was there were some additional things that kind of came out of this that I that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Now, one of them that I wasn't aware of, maybe you were, that kind of supports this concept is the idea that um, there is different levels of insulin sensitivity at different times of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we tend to be more sensitive to insulin earlier in the day. Uh, and there's actually a, a terminology called evening diabetes which they think may be partially due to this difference in sensitivity. So from that standpoint, it, it, would, it would seem to make sense that a earlier in the day loaded diet um, could in fact be processed better. So I will give you that. But well, in- can I piggyback off that? Because sure. I think you just because you brought up you you brought up one of the most important things I think about this. Um, And you actually brought up two and one. So I thank you for that. Um, So what I wanted to say is that I actually think you just touched on what the takeaway from this is. I think there is a great group of people. And unfortunately, now I think it's a larger group of people that would highly benefit from a diet like this. And I think it is people who need to look at insulin resistance and look at cortisol and that have a high cortisol or stress response. I think they would bar none, um, really benefit from this kind of diet. And I think we're living in a society now where we're seeing more insulin resistance and we're seeing people with higher cortisols and that are cortisol driven and that then they would for sure see positive health benefits, weight loss, and just overall improvements in like energy and sleep if they were to follow a diet like this. And we can talk about the physiology of it because I think it's fascinating. But I think that's a really important takeaway that it's not, I don't think necessarily that we all have to eat like this, but there is a large population that if they could just change their eating habits to eat the meals in this order and not snack all day, that they would see a huge benefit. Now... Um, I'm not going to disagree with you, but it is um, it is interesting, and I think somewhat frustrating when you try to make sense of all of the data. One of the arguments that's raised about a study such as this, and one might say, "Well, gosh, how can you argue with a study that involves fifty thousand participants?" But one of the of the arguments that is made against um, putting too much emphasis on on a study like this is this is an observational study. And what that means is that we're basically observing a large population of people. But the argument that's raised against making too many firm conclusions from this is that there may be, uh, because this isn't randomized, there, there may be a number of factors in how for example, the Seventh-day Adventists are living, uh, which actually have a profound effect on their health that may cloud whether or not this particular aspect is that important or not. Now, I think that's an important, I do think that's an important thing is that there's a lot of other factors and variables that go into looking at a population uh, like the Seventh-day Adventists. So so I'm gonna take that a step further, Megan. And I'm going to present another study that was done, um, and it's a study that has been often quoted because it is a randomized study. And this was a study that was done at Vanderbilt University. It it occurred over a 12-week period of time, and what it looked at were a group of people who habitually ate breakfast compared to a group of people who habitually did not eat breakfast. And simply what they did is they changed their routine. And what do you think they found? So I'm a little bit confused. So you're saying that they switched. So if you didn't eat breakfast, they just had you eat breakfast. So, and if you... so the, the calories that were, were consistent between the two groups. Mm-hmm. So they both had a limited caloric intake 
but the the only variable was that in the group that ate breakfast, they did not have them eat the calories at breakfast in in the morning, and in the other group that that didn't eat breakfast, they had them eat calories in 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 the morning. So all they did was they changed the routine of the individuals. And everyone lost weight. That's correct. Everybody did. But this is the interesting thing, and this is actually why I think that there is a certain population that can benefit from the breakfast, is that what I've learned that is the crazy thing about diet is that our natural cravings, our natural desire to the way we eat is not usually driven by what's best from us. It's usually driven from inflammatory markers. And this blows my mind as a clinician, but like, for instance, you can have someone, like you can have a child come in and, you know, they'll ask us, you know, are there foods that I'm sensitive to or that aren't good for me to be putting in my diet? And you can almost always say, is there a food that your child craves that if they do not get that food, they would throw a tantrum, whether, you know, it's sugar or dairy or whatnot. And it's almost always when we check food sensitivities or food allergies, the food that comes back. Um, I'm actually a perfect example for the case for a breakfast feast. I am a very cortisol driven person and you can actually even look at cortisol and people who are cortisol driven by their body types. So if you look at body types, I'm a, the textbook of cortisol and it is my natural tendency to not eat at all during the morning. I could go all day during breakfast, all day during lunch and probably get hungry around three and then I could sit down and eat the biggest feast ever. But that actually is what's not best for my insulin resistance and cortisol levels. And so I think it's fascinating because that study sort of shows that we all tend to eat, whether it's cravings or, you know, hormone driven or what's driving it in a way that's not good for our physiological well-being. Well, I think that's fascinating, Megan, because what you're basically saying is that um, for some reason, and um, I would have to think about this a little bit more, why, why our bodies would, would fool us like this. But what you're basically saying is that, that the cravings are connected to, to inflammation or inflammation markers. And so, so consequently, um, to break that, we almost have to do the opposite of what, what seems to come naturally to us. Well, and so, and one of the ways, so I think a way that I could break this down physiologically, because, you know, there is a difference between the food sensitivities and what I'm about to talk about, but my natural eating tendency, it like if I was to just follow what my body would want, like I said, I can leave the door and get out the house and not even be hungry till 1 p.m. But then at about 2 or 3 p.m., I want to eat everything in sight and I want to come home and eat a big dinner and just eat all of my meal at night. But the problem is, is that what that does is that that A, sets me up to um, not sleep as well, to be inflamed. Um, and it also drives my cortisol late at night where I naturally can be not hungry in the morning because I have higher cortisol levels and cortisol um, can sort of, you know, shut down that hunger. So what I should do instead is eat a big breakfast. And I know this for a fact because you know, when I was able to lose about 40 pounds, the only thing I did was change the way I eat. I didn't snack and I started eating smaller dinners. And that's actually the two things that helped me lose weight the most. And it's funny because as I've gained weight, I've noticed that the things that I'm not doing is I'm now eating, you know, a huge dinner and I'm more stressed and I've been snacking more, which just feeds those cortisol levels. So when we look at hormones and whatnot, it actually is interesting how a lot of times our body drives cravings and inflammatory pathways versus what's best for us. Well, I think that that, um, that makes sense. I guess I would ask you, um, because I think what we're, what we're talking about here is personalizing diet. What would be, would you have a couple factors that you would look at with a particular patient that would drive you to, to recommend, um, such a diet as we're talking about? So if I was to say who should follow this, um, you know, case for a breakfast feast, it should be people that have insulin resistance, a family history of insulin resistance, um, you know, PCOS, um, 
uh, or individuals that know that they're cortisol driven. And there's a Dr. Abraville um, who wrote a book a long time ago called Eat Right for Your Body Type. And even though I don't think everyone can fall into those four categories, that if you do fall really into one main category, like a cortisol driven body, that you do see better um, effects from eating for that body type. And one of the important things about cortisol is not only eating and stacking your calories in the morning, but the other important thing is that you're not snacking. Everybody, you know, they say eat six times a day. That's terrible for cortisol driven people because what you're doing is feeding your adrenals during the day instead of feeding your body. So I think there's a lot of things that we have to look at for individuality, but that's the group that I would say would do really well with um, the takeaways from this article. So let's talk a little bit more when we come back about some of the other articles you found about fasting and uh, ways to eat. You guys are listening to both sides of the prescription and we'll be right back after this commercial break. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show on BBM Global and TuneIn Radio. So, Megan, uh, let's take this um, one step further, and I'm going to refer back to the article that you mentioned because it did indicate in that population that the the group that had the lowest BMI, so the ones that had the, I guess we might even call that the best ideal weight which turned out to be only 8% of the sample, were actually a group who not, who not only um, ate in the morning, but actually f- finished lunch by early afternoon and then again and again and then did not eat again until the next morning. So in fact, what they were doing was not only putting their um, food, into the morning, early afternoon, but they were actually including each day uh, about an eight-hour fast. And this brings up, um, evolution-wise, what I think is undeniable, that our ancestors probably did not have six snacks a day, or they didn't have uh, three full meals, one with dessert. Mm -hmm. They basically were built in such a way that um, they had to eat when they had access to food, and they had they were built in such a way that um, they they could store carbohydrates, but also that uh, they had a more long acting source of nutrition in in the in fat tissue, so that evolutionary wise, uh, likely our ancestors had a diet that. Did have fasting as part of um, as as part of their 
lifestyle. Well, and I think that one of the things that we've learned for sure, so, and we've talked about this in other podcasts, is we know for sure that longevity in health and wellness has been linked to lower calories. Um, and that intermittent fasting seems to have, um, from research and just physiology, um, knowledge that there's some huge benefits to insulin, cortisol, different things like insulin growth factor, uh, you know, other markers too, that have a huge effect on health. I think how you want to fast, um, that's still open for debate. And I think that there might be different ways of fasting that are better for different people. Yeah, I, I think that that's I think that that's true. You know, some of the um, the more popular ones now are a program called Five and Two, where you eat what you normally eat on five days, and then you have two days you fast, which um, are thought to be days where you sh- should have around 500 calories a day. I think um, there are diets which are looking at basically trying to narrow your amount of time that you're eating to six to eight hours a day, meaning that you're fasting the other portion of the day. Um, and then and then there obviously are longer fasts. It should be said that um, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, mm-hmm it's not easy and in the studies that have been done looking at these uh, some of them with positive results they've also found that there's a pretty high dropout rate Um, so they're not necessarily something that you can just pop in feel comfortable doing and leave Uh, it it probably takes a fair amount of discipline to to um, to to kind of tackle these sort of adaptive diets Well, the other thing, moreover, though, from people who do fasting diets, I think the other theme we see a lot is that it gets easier as you do them, that a lot of times, you know, people will give up in that first part because it isn't for the faint of heart. But people who do um, the fasting, they say that after a while, it becomes easier because your body becomes used to it. And that's one of the benefits of it. Yeah, I guess that uh, I don't have a lot of personal experience with it, but um, I, I have talked to some people who have tried different diets, and one of the things that they do say that, that supports what you say, Megan, is that if you're, in a, if you're in a fast where you might be fasting for a period of days, as you go, get into the fast, um, while you may not feel very good for the first couple of days, um, you start to feel better, and actually the fasting becomes much easier. Uh-huh. However, that's a very different approach to fasting you know, where you're doing it um, intermittently, you know, maybe quarterly or every six months versus um, trying to put all your calories into six hours each day or trying uh, two days a week to fast when in actuality the the beginning of the fast is probably the most challenging to, to, you know, um, in in terms of success. Mm Mm-hmm. The other thing that I have from, you know, having a lot of patients that have incorporated some kind of fasting, one of the other things that I think is really beneficial that we don't talk about enough is it also helps to change a little bit your relationship with food. You start to realize, um, you know, what you're eating for fuel and to uh, fuel the body or feed the body versus like cravings. And so even though it's really hard at first, I think one of the reasons why it is hard is because you're dealing with cravings and other signals. But then the more that you go, the more that you sort of get a different relationship with food. And I get that feedback from a lot of people who do this and incorporate it as a lifestyle. So do you have a do you have a standard recommendation that you make to patients if they want to incorporate fasting somehow into their diet? Well, I think there's a couple of different ways. Um, the way that I usually tell people to start, though, is to pick a day of the week for you know numerous weeks. So maybe for the first four weeks or six weeks, just say that you're going to fast, um, you know, maybe Wednesday. So you'll fast from you know. 2 p.m. on Wednesday to 2 p.m. on Thursday. Or what some people will do is, you know, um, fast, uh, you know, from the morning to night, but just pick a 24-hour period. Because the amazing thing is if you fast, you know, every Wednesday to Thursday, you've at the end of the year fasted 52 days. 
you know, which is, you know, the equivalent of over seven weeks. And so you'll have the benefit then of, you know, fasting. Uh, some people will start by just doing 12 hours. So, you know, stopping to eat after two um, and then eating the next day at breakfast. So I think that it's, you know, getting used to it, getting your body to know what to do then in those periods um, between the food and calories and then going from there on what works best for their lifestyle. Well, it sounds like um, it. It sounds like this is an active area, an, an area of interest. I, I think it's something that needs to be examined. Uh, I think that there is evolving data with regard to it, and um, I'm sure we'll talk about it more in other po- podcasts. So, Megan, just to kind of summarize for our listeners, uh, we kind of split this into two two major segments. One was the microbiome. Uh, wanting to talk about it and particularly talk about the microbiome in relationship to how the gut and the brain uh, work in concert. Uh, we talked about support of the microbiome and we talked um, in in a way that we hadn't before about how the microbiome is essential in infancy and how a mother can support with her microbiome the um, the infant's growth and development. Then the second part of what we spoke about this evening was related to diet and and I think two very interesting aspects of diet uh, that have more to do with timing than they do with kind of the caloric in- intake. One of them is is changing your diet so that it is more morning and early afternoon based and less based on the on the uh, evening to uh, evening and then of course the whole fascinating issue of uh, fasting so hopefully this has been um, been of interest to our listeners and hopefully everybody will tune in next week we're here again at 9 p.m eastern time wednesdays on bbm global and tune in radio have a great week and thanks everybody for listening You've been listening to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. So many times, people are only given one side of the healthcare story. Here, you get both sides. Tune in next week as we discover Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron's Both Sides of the Prescription. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.